Funding for Off 90 is provided in part by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the citizens of Minnesota. <laughs> Cruising your way on this episode of Off 90. Learn about a little known but costly maritime disaster that occurred in Lake Pepin. See a performance of a Christmas classic reimagined by Minnesota writers. And get a behind the scenes look at the production of a family musical performed in St. Cloud. It's all just ahead, Off 90. Hi, I'm Barbara Keith. Thanks for joining me on this episode of Off 90. On Lake Pepin is the site of the worst maritime disaster in Minnesota history. In 1890, the Sea Wing, a steamer packed with 215 passengers on a Sunday cruise, capsized on Lake Pepin, drowning 98 people. The steamboat had been about five miles north of Lake City, returning to Red Wing when it was struck by a thunderstorm. Straight line winds flipped the boat. Stated one newspaper headline at the time, the sea wing becomes a floating sepulcher for the pleasure seekers in its cabin. The sea wing disaster, so familiar to turn of the 20th century Minnesotans, slowly disappeared from memory. Here's the story about the sea wing, as well as the efforts to keep its memory alive. There were three cemeteries in Red Wing, and all of them were busy. A series of 44 funerals were conducted in Red Wing, that small town of 6,000 people, in one day. I'm Fred Johnson. I'm a writer and, in this case, the author of The Sea Wing Disaster. The Sea Wing was a work boat, essentially, a steamer that uh, was about 109 feet long and it towed rafts of logs down the Mississippi. In 1890, this boat, Sea Wing, was based in the Wisconsin city of Diamond Bluff, and it was carrying a load of passengers, excursionists, who were going to the Minnesota National Guard encampment at Lake City, Minnesota. So this was on July 13, 1890, very hot, humid summer day, and the captain, the owner of the ship, David Weathern, loaded people at Red Wing. He had taken on some people on the Wisconsin side first, but uh, most of the people on his boat were picked up at Red Wing. David Weathern was an interesting man. He was as much or more a storekeeper than he was a ship's owner. He just kind of ran boats for a, a hobby and a profitable hobby. Uh, so he wouldn't call him a, a true saltwater sailor by any sense. Down the river they went, it was a, a, a fairly nice trip, very placid waters. When they got to Lake City, they found a festive atmosphere. There were popcorn stands and lemonade stands and the National Guard had a band that played. It was a very festive occasion. One of the young women on board Call it the event of the season. Our great-great-grandmother went on the sea wing alone with, with the number of people who went out that day for the excursion. Uh, she left her 12-year-old daughter at home and uh, her husband. We have no idea why great-great-grandma was on the sea wing. Um, back then, women had to be escorted every place that they went. And since she wasn't with her husband, we have no idea. There was more than one disaster on July 13, 1890. The people of St. Paul remember the Lake Jarvis tornado, one of the worst to hit the St. Paul area. The people, of course, uh, down in Lake City, you know, about an hour and a half boat ride away, or maybe two hours, would have no knowledge of that. The program went on very nicely until a late afternoon windstorm, wind and rainstorm, kind of blew the whole activities at the 
Camp Lakeview apart. Um, the captain, after the storm blew over, decided to recall his passengers. There was some concern by people at the dock that a storm seemed to be threatening, but he decided to go ahead. And at eight, he pulled out of Lake City, went up Lake Pepin, which of course is a widening of the Mississippi River. And as he got about uh, what, 20 to 30 minutes out of town, out of Lake City, he noticed heavy winds coming off the Minnesota shore. The wind began to rock the boat and a barge that was attached to it and scaring, of course, the people inside because it was getting more and more violent. The women and the children were in the cabin on the, on the, of the boat uh, because the storm started coming up and everybody went into the cabin to get out of the storm. And there, they were there when a heavy wave came up, pushed the two boats apart. And in a few seconds, a heavy gust of wind pushed the sea wing up on its about a 45 degree angle and then flipped it over, upside down. David Weathern was in the pilot house, obviously, as the boat is about to, to roll over. And when the boat rolled, that meant he was the deepest in the water. He swam as long as he could and he surfaced and he found himself clear. He was one of the people who got on the bottom of the boat. And immediately he was wondering about his children and wife. The next morning he found out that his wife had drowned and then in a few hours later his young son had drowned as well. His other boy, Roy, did survive. We have people trapped and dying and drowning underneath uh, in the cabin underneath the waters of Lake Pepin. Several incredibly brave uh, young men got into boats and rowed out onto the still very dangerous lake and went out to Central Point, just really a little bit north of Lake City. And there's where they found the accident scene and rescued several people, not many. Most had already drowned. It was all at night, and it was a dark night. The clouds were <laughs> very stormy. The only light they had to work by was lightning, and that was frequent, along with some severe hail. The boat was then towed ashore, or at least near shore, off of Central Point. And from that point on, on Monday and Tuesday, bodies were being taken off of the boat. The boat was partially submerged, so it was very difficult to get all of the people who had drowned off of the boat. And as we know, there were about 70 bodies removed. I first learned about the Sea Wing disaster when I was a, a small child, uh, I can, as far back as I can remember. My great grandma was telling about, she remembered walking down Plum Street the day after the storm, the day after the capsizing and um, how the sidewalks were torn up and there were tree limbs all over in the streets and then walking down to the place where they were collecting the bodies. In the 70s, my dad decided to interview his grandmother who was 97 years old at the time and to gather some of her stories. And of course, one of the main stories of her life was the event of what happened to her mother on the sea wing. I remember standing on the sidewalk and they wanted me to, to go through and identify my mother. I had to go through the whole length of the hall with bodies on both sides. My mother was in the tail end and I'll never forget it. Um, Uncle Tom asked, where was your dad? Why didn't he do that? And great grandma said, oh, I don't know. I suppose he'd been in before, I don't know but I remember going up there alone. I stood on the sidewalk and screamed, and I said, I don't want to go, I don't want to go, but I was made to go. And she was taken from the undertaking parlor, uh, put in a lumber wagon, and hauled out to the Belvedere Cemetery. And she didn't talk really about being with her father through any of this. We don't know anything about where her father was, except that Eventually, he, he left her, his 12-year-old daughter in foster care and he, he left Red Wing. I can't imagine being that little girl. But 
My, our great grandma grew up to be a, a feisty and spirited and she lived to be 97 years old, so she had grit. My great grandfather would be one of the people working to take the bodies off the boat and put them on the wagons for, to carry them up to the funeral parlors. This story to me has a, a personal aspect and it's not just because of a great grandfather who I never knew. To me, when I started researching the story, it was clearly forgotten. It, there was no record of it. I shouldn't say no record. There was one, at the Minnesota Historical Society, one memorial service program, and that was the only mention of it. 98 people dying, all of them deserve to be remembered, and that's what I set out to do. Was the Night Before Christmas is one of the most familiar and favorite poems associated with the holidays. Minnesota writer Jennifer Kirkaby and songwriter Shirley Meyer took a creative approach to how the holiday classic might have been written. Their version of Twas the Night Before Christmas was performed by the Matchbox Children's Theater in Austin. <laughs> with a wonderful imagination to craft a most wonderful holiday tale. A miracle is exactly what I'll need. Oh. It was the night before Christmas. The musical itself just is bringing the poem to life with music and dance and acting. And the way that we did it is we thought it would be really cool to have the original writer be on a ticking clock, like he has to come up with this poem by Christmas Eve. And so he's home with his kids running around and all these distractions. And he can't, you know, he's got writer's block. He can't do it. But slowly these magical things start happening with these sugar plum fairies and they're kind of his muse and it's comedic and all these things start happening and this poem sort of unfolds for him. Dear Saint Nicholas, did you have a nice one? Dear Saint Nicholas, we're so I think we get each other. <laughs> We're, um, we have a little quirky sense of humor. We, I think that comes out in our writing and our music. Like Jennifer says, we, we kind of get each other. It is a lot of work to shape the show to be what we want it to be. Right. Uh, but we, we, and we seem to be on the same page a lot of times. And we work really easily together. And sometimes we get tired and so we make up lyrics and send them back right. <laughs> that no one can ever see. That's right. <laughs> It's just fun, you know, the process, you know, bouncing ideas off each other, both, you know, at the beginning and then midway through, and as we're tweaking things mm -hmm. uh, when it's moving towards production. And we've, we've got each other's backs. We've both gone through a lot the last few years personally. Then I think that, like, was really hard for me to write at some point. You were there for me, and I hope I was there for you. I think this place is beautiful. It's absolutely charming. It has so much character, and um, there's stars on the ceiling. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so cool. just like the uptown, yes, indeed. I thought they gave it 100%. The costumes were beautiful. Um, it was directed very well. One thing that I, we hadn't seen before was uh, this production was performed with just the piano accompaniment. Because right. uh, sometimes we have an accompaniment CD uh, that comes with the show, but uh, which is fully orchestrated. But uh, this production with was with just piano and it worked really well. And so it was truly live theater and that was really, really nice to see. And the yeah. voices, of course, uh, really beautiful. And the kids were great, so they're darling.
reads it at the end and uh, it is sung. Uh, the entire poem is, uh, is sung by the cast, Clement and his family, and all of the characters that appear in the play, and of course, St. Nicholas, too. The Great Theatre is a theatre company based in St. Cloud. Recently, they performed a musical called Children of Eden. It features families from the biblical book of Genesis. Get a behind-the-scenes look at how the actors prepared for their production. And we can see that in the lobby during all performances. We hope that your family will join us for an exciting 14-15 season that kicks off with Dolly Parton's 9 to 5 in September. Thank you for supporting the great theater. Now sit back, relax, and enjoy Children of Eden. greatest thing about being involved in the great theater and community theater in general is is that it's something for the whole family. Uh, they're usually family-oriented shows and, and something that uh, uh, you can do with your kids. This show in specific, it's, a, it's really a family show. Um, it's got a, so many parts for kids, it was just a, a no-brainer for our family to be involved. We've been involved in theater for, for years. It's, it's not a show just for kids. Um, it's not a show just for adults, it, it really hits that span right between. So there's a significant role, a, a meaningful part for everyone. Although I don't really think it's, I mean, it doesn't align with the story that's in the Bible. I wouldn't call it a religious story. Um, I think it's a really beautiful story and it's about second chances and um, redemption, about forgiveness, about moving forward, about being a parent and what that feels like, being a child and what that feels like. I grew up doing community theater. Uh, the, I started doing community theater when I was 10 or 11. I remember um, the electricity and the excitement and the disappointment when you don't get in a show and, the, and just the, the journey that you take as a kid where this means everything. Oh, how I sigh to see. Oh, how I sigh to see. How much wood could a woodchuck chuck if a woodchuck could chuck wood? How much wood could a woodchuck chuck? Community theater as a kid are lessons that I've carried with me through my adulthood. I mean, everything about being where you say you'll be, being responsible, learning to work together as a team, following through, um, working with people who might be very different from you are, all those wonderful, rich lessons, getting those same lessons, and getting those same experiences. Generation. When I think about what the show means for our family, um, it's it's really a chance to connect for one, um, especially with Garrett in the show and the girls. I think it will always be a good 
um, a good memory for them. To build a, a new closeness with our family, I think, is definitely a benefit. Um, what I see it bringing to each of them is just different because they have different roles um, and they're not just seen as, you know, the lathe kids or the sisters. They're each seen for who they are. My sister Kate, she is the snake. She is also a frog and also a storyteller. Emma, she's a child of Seth, a storyteller, and a lizard. The spark of creation, that's all you got left now. And my dad, he got the biggest role. God. Um, just the different personalities, the, the, the children who are super intellectual about the show and very invested in that way. One who is a bit more um, out there with the ability to just try to, to wow people and, and, and to enjoy the laughter. You know, this family in particular have a chance to do their thing and to shine and to support each other has just been so much fun. Like, bigger parts get the mic. <laughs> That's kind of like how it rolls. So I was excited about the bigger part. They gave me a part that most kids don't get. Most kids don't get a big role and a mic, but I got it, and it, that was a great, that was a great thing for me. Everything in this show, the director wanted to look like things that were just found, not necessarily constructed or made specifically for the show. I think my daughter was in a show in 2003, and then one of my sons was in a show. And then my daughter got into it a little more consistently. And that year I started helping out at the scene shop with the painting. And then pretty soon I was the prop master. Well, there's this really awesome staff that is passed down from Adam to Noah. And it's this tall stick. And I actually didn't find it. One of the actors had it already and has vines wrapped around it. And it's really cool. There's a lot of storytellers in this show, and so they kind of all have a look that brings them together as a group. And then when they become different characters, they add little pieces. Um, it's minimal so that the audience really gets to, you know, kind of use their imagination and be part of the show that way. I would say it's a little non-traditional for great. At each show always, offers different techniques and different cast sizes and things like that. So it might be a new experience for our audience this time to see something a little more minimal. Looks like, is it this? Yeah, this is my skirt. Did they changed my costume a billion times. We don't typically do a summer show, so it's kind of a new experience to see how that works in people's schedules. Actors are pretty generous, and I think they have to be each other's net. And I really believe that that's there for my husband and for the, the three girls who are acting in this show. No one's going to just leave anyone stranded. That's not what actors do. Uh, we're on stage, and Allison says, talk amongst yourselves. Then you kind of make friends just talking. A lot of times it's just really random stuff like the shape of Minnesota or how the tree in our backyard needs to be cut down or... I don't want to break it. Actors, please practice being quiet backstage while they're finishing checking the levels in the pit.
being in shows like this gives them a, a sense of confidence that they don't get in other disciplines. Academics is important, uh, you know, building, building your intellect. Uh, um, athletics is important, keeping your body in shape. Uh, and arts is important. Uh, arts is really the spirit side of a person. It's that intangible in between intellect and, and physicality. The wonderful thing about something like great theater is that it's not just for the cast. It's not just for those who want to perform. It is for the community. That's all for this episode. Please help Off90 meet its financial obligations by becoming a member of KSMQ Public Television. Give us a call at 507-481-2095 or 1-800-658-2539 or sign up online at ksmq.org. Thanks for watching. Join us next time, Off90. Funding for Off 90 is provided in part by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the citizens of Minnesota.